put that question uh, to put that question or comment into the chat dialog box. If you're new to Zoom and uh, don't know how that works, if you put your cursor to the bottom of the Zoom screen, certainly on my version, right at the end, there's an option for more options. If you click on that, at the top, you should have chat, and that should therefore open the chat dialog box. And what I've done is I've put my uh, email address right at the top of that dialog box. So if anybody has any remaining questions at the end or uh, wants to contact me afterwards, please feel free to use that um, email address. Nice. Just got one or two more people yeah. Yeah. joining. Okay. Good. Again, I can hear some to if I can just remind people to um pop themselves on mute, that would be great. Okay. Um thank you for giving up your lunch time. Um th there may be a chat function on Zoom. Apparently there isn't a tea, coffee or sandwich function, so I can't offer those. Um, but the first thing I'd just like to say is, is why give this um, webinar? The case um, raised a lot of issues and I saw a lot of articles and blogs written on it. And I thought what might be helpful would be to give a picture of the case, for example, how it unfolded from the point of view of um, mine being counsel for the defendant, to give you a little bit more of a picture about not only the issues that it um, raised, but how it raised them. Um, there are two real messages from this case, which I think transpose not just personal injury, but any complex case. Um, one of them is blindingly obvious, which is that a complex case like this requires hard work and good preparation. Uh, it was very much a team effort, and can I, at the outset, thank Mark Brennan and his team at Hexfords, who did a fantastic job and certainly um, supported me enormously in uh, the trial. The other important message, which in part overlaps with the previous one, um, is that experts should be properly prepared for trial. Their evidence should be scrutinized and kept up to date. And there are some really important passages in the judgment in Scarcliffe, but also in the case of Miape, which was a previous decision by the same judge which I'd encourage you to have a look at if you haven't done already. Um, I'm going to assume that you've already either read the judgment in Scarcliffe or have a, a good um, summary of it, but nevertheless remind you of a few key facts in the judgment for the background, and also then turn to um, a couple of other important points which you won't get from the judgment. The case facts with these, the claimant suffered two transverse process spinal fractures on the left side, L2 and L3, possibly a third, but that made their difference. Other minor injuries when he was struck by a falling tree trunk at work as a tree surgeon. A full or almost full recovery um, was expected within months. However, the claimant developed a pain condition and listed numerous symptoms not limited to his lower back, claimed that those symptoms were life-changing and that he'd been transformed from a hard-working and physically active man into someone who uh, was largely dependent on others. At the time of the accident, the claimant and his partner had three children with a fourth on the way. By trial, there were five children, uh, two of whom were severely disabled with complex care needs. And it's important to stress just how disabled they were, 24-hour care needed, for example. So the claimant sought damages, including care not only for himself, 
but also to replace the significant care he asserted he would have provided to his children, but for the accident. 100% um, liability for the accident was admitted, and we as defendants accepted that the claimant had developed a pain condition, but we argued that one, many of the symptoms of which he complained were not accident related, and two, that he would have developed pain and restrictions of movement in any event. He would therefore have likely developed a pain condition in any event. And he was exaggerating the extent of his pre-accident care activities for his children and also his post-accident restrictions. Um, the schedule of loss came in at over £6 million. Pounds. Uh, six million one hundred and fifteen thousand one hundred forty seven pounds and fifty five p to be precise and our counter schedule came in at one hundred and thirty six thousand eight hundred twenty four pounds and seventy nine pence exclusive of general damages so there was uh, a huge difference between us um some other elements of the case which don't appear from the judgment and which again paint a bit of a picture I hope uh, Mr. Justice Cotter, who some of you know is a PI expert or was at the bar, was the ideal judge for the case from the defendant's point of view. Now, of course, we didn't know that we would get him or indeed who we would get until about a week or so before the trial. Uh, he was, in fact, prepared to be pretty tough on the claimant, despite his personal circumstances and sympathy for him. For example, he awarded in the judgment pretty much the figure that was in our closing submissions and what we called scenario B. We said in round terms 261,000. In round terms, he awarded 275. And the judge must have known that we wouldn't pitch our scenario B um, above our part 36 offer, which I'll come to later. But um, we had a significant amount of room room and I'll deal with the costs and the consequences at the end of the, uh, the session. Um, who the judges shouldn't make a difference, uh, but it does. The last Cosmone trial in Birmingham, again, a very difficult case, listed in front of a deputy high court judge who was in fact a property expert. And he knew about as much about personal injury as I know about overriding interests in registered land. He got the law enforceability wrong in the draft judgment and then got it wrong again when he changed the draft judgment, having seen my draft grounds of appeal. Um, he was basically bending over backwards to help the claimant. And the point being, of course, there is always an element of luck of withdrawal in any case, which has to be accounted for. And we were acutely aware, leading up to the trial, that any judge was likely to have significant sympathy for the claimant and his family and therefore we try to be as generous as possible for example in terms of what we allowed in our part 36. And there are always uh, in these cases that there were in this one what I describe as non-legal or tactical factors that you have to take into account uh, and one of the issues in this case which I've been asked about um, previously was fundamental dishonesty. And we all know that fundamental dishonesty, it's a very powerful weapon for defendants. And it's a nightmare for claimants, or perhaps better expressed for their solicitors if they're on a CFA. And we also know that if fundamental dishonesty is found, the judge has all but no choice but to dismiss the whole claim, not yet come across where the exception has been applied, and so tactically, there are always difficulties. If you have a judge who's reluctant to give a claimant nothing, that may push him into finding in favour of a defendant, for example, on the facts of a case about how an accident happened. And if you, the judge is pushed into finding for a defendant on how the accident happened, that may mean that you lose arguments on contributory negligence. Now, in this case, we didn't have, for example, surveillance which nailed the claimant as being a liar, and we accepted he had a pain condition. 
perhaps the way I would describe it is that in amongst uh, a huge mosaic of evidence, we had what I describe as quite a few tiles of elements of potential fundamental dishonesty. There were discrepancies, for example, between the witness statements and the benefit forms. What we did, we had a fully pleaded counter schedule with details of how we put the case. And of course, you don't have to plead expressly fundamental dishonesty, just the facts that you rely on. And so we left it at that. If you look at the judgment in Scarcliffe, paragraph 96 onwards, for example, you'll see that during the trial, a family assessment for the um, disabled children's needs was disclosed. And although the actual assessment had taken place a while beforehand, we were never quite sure, because it wasn't dated, when that document was produced uh, and how late it had been disclosed. I think it's fair to say the judge was, was furious, you look at paragraph 170, but there were still risks in alleging fundamental dishonesty, including, I think the main one, was that we would almost certainly have had to recall the claimant of his wife, to give evidence about that, to ask some questions. Otherwise, it would be open to appeal, we thought. So tactically, we took the decision not to allege fundamental dishonesty. We had the claimant's evidence of all its faults and the judge's preliminary views about that assessment document in the bank. And that's where we stuck after some, I'd say, considerable thought. So that's a bit of background. And I then turn to the two lessons which I think can be uh, particularly drawn from this case. And one is this statement of the obvious, as I put it, which is the requirement for a close analysis of the evidence. And what this case required and benefited from was a detailed analysis of all the various records, that's GP, hospital records, treatment notes and benefit applications, which I increasingly find are really useful documents. And in this case, of course, they're also records relating to the children. And only then could a complete picture be put together of the claim as it was put against the reality of both pre and post accident um, life in the Scarcliffe household. Um, and to take an example about how these things work in practice and how it worked in practice in this case, the claimant had pleaded that he would have kept on working in the absence of the accident. Now, there was one single handwritten, difficult to read entry on one document, which is in fact a spinal assessment. And it made a huge and fatal hole in that case because the claimant had said that he was not going back to tree work and was a full-time carer. And that spinal assessment had taken place within weeks of the accident. And the claimant accepted in cross-examination that he still thought he'd be going back to work because he would, well, he could have got back to work because he'd recover as expected. And it was within the expected recovery period, as the experts agreed. And we were able to give the judge page reference after page reference, which we used in cross-examination, to just compare what the claimant was saying against the actual picture. For example, if you look at paragraph 59, we had a medical report from previous road traffic accident, which again enables us to make really useful comparisons between what the claimant was saying in this case and what he was saying elsewhere. Another useful example is that the claimant's wife had recorded that she had written out his benefit application forms, which included a statement he was, quote, 100% dependent on others because she'd written those uh, forms out because he was both dyslexic and disabled. Her all evidence at trial was a long and emotional speech about the care which Taylor had provided and which he would provide. And it was difficult and indeed probably unwise to try and interrupt that flow of, of emotional evidence. Um, what we had, however, 
was the fact that the judge concluded, and it was pretty obvious, that she would have been reluctant to leave her disabled 100% dependent husband caring for her two children with significant needs on a daily basis. Judges wouldn't buy that, and that's pretty obvious. So it was that one entry on her part, namely that um, her husband needed 100% care, that allowed us to just simply very easily undermine her evidence. So I, I'm grateful for many of the things that Mark and his team at Hexalls did, and one of which was to go through all those records and produce notes in a chronological order. And those that worked with me will know that I do the same in any case. It's very easy now on PCs and laptops. And it helps in many ways. Uh, and just to show that I'm not completely defendant minded because I act for both. I did a case not so long ago where a claim to be badly injured in an RTA, including a very nasty ankle fracture. We were served by the defendant with surveillance of her taking a walk around London for a day at which she clearly became tired and, and, and limped a bit at the end of the day. But we were able to use our chronology to show that that day was after a really long, prolonged period of physiotherapy. So our experts would say, well, that's exactly what you'd expect after that treatment. And we were able, therefore, to diffuse the surveillance and still get a good settlement. And if you want a stark example of why I say just putting things in chronological order really works, look at the judgment in Mayape, the paragraph 323, where that's exactly what the judge did. And he set out the chronology of the claims uh, treatment, the pretty stark surveillance they had in that case, including the man who said he was dependent on, on walking sticks and dancing. And that led to the judge making some pretty stern findings, including one of, of fundamental dishonesty. So again, I hope I've not accused of stating the obvious, but that hard work and that hard analysis, uh, it, it cannot be or should not be avoided. And it, and it pays dividends. Moving on, though, to the expert evidence, which is where a lot of the key lessons from um, Scarcliffe and the Ape need to be gleaned. Um, we got a message, in fact, from the judge in advance of the trial saying, please read me, Ape, and um, what I said in that case. And so we all look back at his quotes. Um, and if you look at 145 in Scarcliffe, he was pretty clear. He says, if an expert's view has changed, they should communicate this to their own side and the other side and the court as soon as possible. Now note the requirement to communicate it to the other side. So you have to be very careful. If you're thinking about, well, holding something back and trying to negotiate your way out of trouble, because that can come back to bite you certainly on costs. And the judge said an expert should not step into a witness box having changed his or her view without having made this plain beforehand, because he said it might need to uh, alter, for example, the need or the extent of evidence uh, that was required to be given. Now, of course, it might affect whether you need to call experts, but that's from a judge's perspective. If you look at it from a, a, a practitioner's perspective, it's a bit like finding, when you get a change of opinion, that you've made a mistake in a Sudoku puzzle. You, you suddenly find everything's been thrown out. For example, the orthodox, orthopods might change their mind, which throws out the pain expert, which throws out the care expert, as in this case. It's rather like having to unwind that Sudoku puzzle and get back to the point where all numbers are right before you can move forward. And when you move forward, you might find there's been a radical change in the value of the case. One way or another, I mean, there's an equal danger in undervaluing a case because you haven't analysed any change in opinion. Uh, and again, just to stress the point, the judge said a party is entitled to know as soon as is practicable if an expert instructed by an opposing party has materially changed his or her opinion. 
So you have to work fast. And one of the factors that he said um, was relevant to that was negotiations, that the party should always strive to reach a negotiated settlement. And that without transmitting changes of opinion, the negotiations might not take place at all or proceed on a fundamentally incorrect basis. So what I'll do now is just take a quick diversion to talk about settlement in this case, because I'm asked about whether there'd been a JSM. And the answer is yes, there had been relatively late. And there's always that balance between how much you give away of your cross-examination material, particularly when the evidence is pretty much complete, and how much you throw at trying to get a, a settlement. And it was pretty clear to us um, going into the JSM that there was very much what I would describe a broad brush rather than detailed view being taken on the other side. We were made a very high seven-figure offer with no prospect of coming down at all. So we drew stumps relatively early. But what we did, having uh, received a seven-figure Part 36 offer from the claimant shortly afterwards, we put in a pretty detailed written opening, and that was a few days before trial. Uh, and it was pretty clear that by that stage, there'd been a bit more preparation on the other side. And the benefit that we got out of our written opening was that a proactive judge, and he is proactive, Mr. Justice Cotter. He, he can be blunt, he can be very direct, but he is sharp, uh, he, he does his preparation. And he's also, I should say, unfailingly polite, but it meant he came into court and he was pretty much on top of the, the difficulties that the claimant had and was expressing doubts early on about how he could be asked to award the sort of figures he was being asked to on the evidence that he'd seen. So that was an exercise on our part, if you like, of getting your retaliation in first. And it's about reading the tribunal and, and reading when to hit the other side with, with the benefits of the work that you've done. Uh, to the point whereby, um, very early on at trial, we got a substantial uh, discount by way of an offer in the part 36 of claimants have made us. Uh, and I'm, I'm very grateful our insurers, Tokyo Marine, just said, hey, stand firm, we've made a very good offer. And in fact, on about day three, the claimant offered to take our part 36 plus costs. Uh, and we said no, because, you know, we'd done our prep. We got our figure right. We knew they knew that they were in trouble, and we didn't see the reason. Uh, it wasn't an easy decision, but we didn't see the reason to throw away our costs advantage. So, you know, again, going back to the obvious points, the later you leave your preparation, the more you put yourself at disadvantages. And I'm speaking from a claimant's point of view here. I often find there's a temptation on the part of claimants to prepare the case in a certain way, only from their own perspective. And to use an expression that the judge uses, all these cases are worth stress testing. Have a look. Where are the cross-examination points for your defendant? Where are you weak? What do you have to deal with? I think unless you've been through that process, you can get badly caught out with the wheels coming off from day one, as happened in this case. If you end up with a, a stubborn, unreasonable opponent like me, you end up with cost orders against you. And again, I'll come back to that. But back to the experts. Um, and really, I'll deal with, with two of the disciplines because the judge was critical of the claimant's expert pain evidence. And he was highly critical of the claimant's care expert. Um, dealing with pain. Uh, and I have sympathy for the claimant's expert here because he simply hadn't been told pre-trial that there'd been a late change of opinion, joint change of opinion by the orthopods. What had happened was that uh, the claimant had been shown to have an L5-S1 disc prolapse and the experts, the orthopedic experts, had mistakenly agreed that it was on one side um, when in fact it was on the left, 
rather than the right. Uh, and that meant that they agreed that the left leg symptoms the claimant was um, experiencing numbness, for example, were not accident related. Now, the pain expert didn't know that change of opinion and was therefore stuck with the fact, for example, he described the left leg symptoms as being serious with a poor prognosis. The poor chap had to try and rove back from that in the witness box. He, he was unsuccessful and the judge was having none of it. And of course, that began then to unravel his view about the causation, which is what this case was all about, and the claimant's pain condition. What effect it would have had, had that change of opinion on the orthopods come earlier and he'd been notified, is a moot point. You know, it's the Sudoku point again. Would the claimants have gone back, looked at the effect on their case and revalued it? I like to think that they would, um, but who knows? It's a matter for them, really. The other difficulty that their pain expert had was it will be seen if you look at the judgment is paragraphs 149 and 150. At the last moment, and I, I just don't know why it came this late, and their expert was asked to deal with whether some of the claimants apparently non-accident related symptoms, for example, numbness, could be due to his very high levels of medication. Uh, we, uh, and perhaps more importantly, the judge, were served with pages of articles and dragged off the web the night before. And yeah. that went down particularly badly with the judge. It didn't cut on the ice with him. And again, the benefits of having a very experienced judge was that he just pulled it apart in about three sentences. So, you know, the moral of that it may again be another obvious one, but spot the issues, get them dealt with when advanced the trial, uh, because to do so otherwise simply further undermine the pain expert, and you can see in judgment the way that the uh, judge came out in favour of the defendant's pain expert and, and the effect that, that had on the, the value of the claim. And turning to the care expert, um, we all know that care claims can, uh, and they very often are, uh, be a major element in high value PI cases. And you know, that's increasingly so given that the cost of care, if you've got big multipliers uh, and things like equipment, the, the extent of and value of equipment that can be obtained nowadays. And I advise anyone who hasn't done it to date to read paragraphs 283 onwards in the APE because this judge was setting out some pretty strong views on, on how he thought care evidence were dealt with, for example, he lamented the fact that single joint experts, even in high value claims, are not being used often enough. He thought that, you know, properly instructed and um, used properly, single joint expert would be quite acceptable, even in high value cases. I think he's really railing against what he sees as kind of entrenched positions. And he also lamented in the app the fact that the claimant's expert that never in fact acted for a defendant. And he said that he thought that that perhaps skewed that expert's view. Uh, and I'm on record before as saying, it's all very well when you're claimed or defendant against someone who bats for one particular side, but it always leaves you not only open to cross-examination, but the problem that that expert hasn't seen it from the other side of the fence, just like with counsel and understands the sort of points that may be made against them. And in fact, if you look at paragraph 175 in Scarcliffe, the judge's judgment says an expert should constantly remind themselves throughout the litigation process. They're not part of the claim or defendant's team with their role being the securing and maximizing or avoiding or minimizing the claim for damages. And simply put, if your expert is clearly batting for your side, that's never going to go down well. Um, again, perhaps an obvious point, but worth remembering, and this is going to be picked up because you know, it's going to be the template for the way cases are approached in, in the future. 
What I would say about this case, which perhaps makes it a particular example, is, and I'm not being personal about this, but you, you can read it in the judgment. The care evidence for the claimants in this case was an absolute disaster, uh, particularly so much related to, to care, uh, both in respect of what the claimant needed and what he would have provided to the children. Um, if you look at the judgment, paragraph 167, for example, the judge said that there were obvious errors and omissions pointed out. Um, uh, uh, paragraph 231, you'll see that the care expert in her first report actually managed to miss out one of the um, claimant's five children from her report. And I was able to put to her, well, did you um, miss that child out, even though you've been told about that child, or did the claimant forget to tell you you had five children? She accepted she'd been told about that child, but she'd simply missed that child out. And I said, well, it's not a good start, is it? And she said, no. And poor thing, you know, you could see um, she knew it was going wrong, and it was a very uncomfortable um, experience for her, as the judge pointed out. But again, you have to ask yourself why that report was served in that state. The judge described her evidence as unsatisfactory and or ill thought through. And even when he, um, having raised issues with her before her cross-examination, uh, sent her away to ha have a think about her uh, expert report. Uh, she came back in, uh, again, pretty unprepared. And she, for example, maintained a care a claim, the care that the claimant would have been giving for his children from 4 p.m. till 8 p.m., five days a week, when the claimant's only case was he didn't get home from work before six and often later. Uh, it, it was a pretty sad state of affairs. And I'm afraid um, the claimant's expert agreed with me eventually. There's still fundamental problems with her uh, report. Um, again, to take an example, footnote 35, paragraph 172, um, the, the claimant claimed care the children post his retirement hours that he would have given once he'd stopped working. And that expressly included um, him looking after the children after school, doing the school run for Eli and Una, and dressing them and supervising them. Uh, by the date of his retirement, those children would have been in their late 20s. Uh, my son's 22, and even though he can't always get his pants on the right way, he doesn't appreciate my help in that department anymore. And the judge was pretty sure that Eli and Una wouldn't have done either. I and mean, these are basic mistakes. I hope that anybody who I'm lecturing to at the moment would simply not make them. But for some reason, they got through in this case, uh, and it forced the judge into making some uh, pretty stern findings. But if you look at paragraphs 171, 172, Judge said as follows, in my experience, the content of care reports is sometimes transposed directly into schedules and counter schedules by lawyers with limited critical analysis or challenge. If care experts fail to exercise reasonable skill in care, which is expected of those who hold themselves out as experts and don't fully abide by the well-known requirements of an expert in litigation, this can lead to unrealistic evaluations which impede just resolution of claims. And that's what exactly happened in this case. And it's in that context, the judge said that the uh, expert report should be carefully scrutinized and stress tested. Uh, again, have a look at Miape, for example, and the way the judge dealt with equipment that was claimed in that case. Uh, you know, equipment being claimed that had nothing to do with the claimant's disability or equipment like a microwave that was clearly the sort of thing that would be found in anybody's kitchen in any event. Uh, it's that sort of stress test which it, it, it is required. So some practical thoughts. Um, go through that stress test and make sure you're happy the report can be justified if that's right, fine, base your schedule on it. 
Uh, but it's not great to end up having to plead a schedule or a counter schedule that departs from a report that's been served. That probably creates more problems for claimants than defendants. But let's take the sort of current trend in claiming for dog walking, which has been allowed in, in quite a few cases. If your report claims 10 hours per week for dog walking at full carer rates, as was the case here, it, it should and, and it's likely to be shot down. Um, now, if your claimant reports and you are a claimant, sets that down in the schedule, what you may have to do is just simply say, well, we're not sticking by that. But you then lay yourself open to your expert being cross-examined on the basis that, well, you've put something in your report that even your advisors are prepared to go with. It's somewhat defendant, easy for defendants. I mean, at least you can use the, you know, the formula, for example, that the um, defendant's prepared to concede for reasons of proportionality that you know, X, Y, Z should be allowed if you think that your report is particularly harsh. So go through and look at the realities. Um, for example, in this case, the judge made it clear that he thought that there was exaggeration of the care claim for the children because much of it would overlap with two children being cared for at the same time. It's an obvious point. Uh, and also look at um, paragraph 231D, which is an example of the judge going through the menial care tasks that he said be costed at agency rates, I mean, 27 quid an hour for dog walking. Um, and also, they were rates produced by an agency with which the candidate's care expert uh, had an association, which again, made life very difficult for her. Um, look at paragraph 294, where the judge reminds everybody of the test. The claimant is entitled to damages to meet his reasonable needs arising from his injuries. In considering what is reasonable, I have had regard to all the relevant circumstances, including the requirement for proportionality as being the cost of the defendant of any individual item and the extent of the benefit which will be derived by the claimant from that item. And he said that there are some elements of care claimed which would be more appropriate for general damage. So rather than, for example, awarding damages for a dog walker, he said he would take into account the fact that a dog walk was something that the claimant could no longer carry out as well as he could before. And that was a loss of immunity, small additions to general damages. Turning then to the future conduct of claims, um, you know, I've already indicated in respect of expert evidence how future claims can be conducted to better resolve them at lower cost. Um, it's often the case, certainly when I get directions, that in complex cases, the care expert joint statement um, will be completed after the other experts have reported so that they can see the range of different opinions that they've got to deal with. And um, I will put in a personal plea at this stage um, for some guidance to be given to care experts that the form in which their joint statement should be. Tables can be really useful, but if they become over complex with references back to reports and different scenarios, they can become unhelpful. And I've seen cases, not, not this one, where it's really difficult to work out what the areas of agreement and disagreement are, particularly if there isn't a summary at the end saying who's moved to what position. So a bit of a cry for the wilderness from me on that one. Um, in pain cases, I think there's an argument for the pain experts only producing their joint statement when all the other experts um, have come in. And if you look at paragraph 145 in the Scarcliffe judgment, uh, that's a stark example of, of how a staggered uh, approach might have helped. Um, as I say, the orthopedic changes came late in, in, in that case, but not all of them. There was some movement early on. Um, but we all know that there are cases where the orthopedic joint statements will come in and then have changed their view on causation or acceleration periods. And it might be useful for the pain experts only to report when they've seen those come in. And I'm very much in favor of staggered joint statements or indeed 
Um, I've seen cases where the joint sykes, for example, come in saying, well, you know, causation and prognosis in this case is really one for the pain experts. And you get the pain experts joint statement, and they say, well, this is really one for the sykes. Uh, and what you have to try and do then is engineer it to get some sort of view about where the experts are. And um, if the pain experts get to Sykes joint reports first, you can at least try and manage that a bit better. It may, for example, allow you to target questions better. Uh, there's a further alternative, actually, which I've tried in a couple of cases, which is to get some of the experts who overlap, for example, Sykes and Pains, to at least start a joint um, statement process together, have all four of them. So you might say we'll have two sessions, one where you get together and decide whose area of expertise is well, where they overlap. And then when you've got that sorted out, go away and try and sort out your differences or at least express um, where you are a part of and why. And I think a bit of thinking outside the box is worth at least trying in these cases. And if you get in front of a specialist judge like um, Mr. Justice Cotter, you may well find that, that he's sympathetic to it. But if you're left really with, with you know, questions to try and sort things out, try and make them well-directed. Sometimes seeing questions which are guilty of just being, well, are you sure that's your opinion? You know, have a look to see what the court's going to be asking. For example, you might ask that uh, if the court accepts the defendant's evidence and version of events, for example, as to when he was first complaining of back pain, does that change your opinion and, and how? So again, just be a little more creative uh, and a little more formulaic. And um, turning lastly to costs, um, the outcome of the trial um, was interesting. Um, not only did we obtain the usual order because the claim had failed by some considerable way to beat our Part 36 offer, we were able to negotiate an order that we paid only a percentage, in fact, 72.5% of their cost pre-part 36. Um, the other side brought in their um, insurers uh, and they were desperate to do a deal. Uh, and we got a very good result, one which I frankly was surprised at, that we got it and grabbed it with both hands. You won't be surprised to know that the order also included provision that we didn't have to pay for any of the claims care experts' reports. Let me finally just touch very briefly on cost budgeting. I, I, I'm not going to deal with fixed costs. Um, that's another lecture for another day. Um, but cost budgeting, if you look through the judgments in Miyako and Scarcliffe, I think you get a position which I've often sort of worried about, that um, expert evidence and the way it's formulated develops during a case is it, it, not as linear as cost budgets and phase, the phase approach seems to assume. And from a practical point of view, and we all know that things have changed um, largely because of the pandemic and the, the advent of Zoom. I mean, it used to be the case that, you know, if you were asked to go up to Manchester, as I often was, to have a conference with five experts, um, one of whom invariably couldn't make it, you would phone in, you really couldn't hear what they were saying. Uh, at great expense to insurers because you're taking uh, experts out for a whole day uh, and they were never particularly keen to be away from their practice if they were still practicing. It, it was a kind of um, you know, one big conference was really all you could you know, really expect. Now we all know that if you need to speak to an expert, you can do it by Zoom. You can get hold of them much more easily. You can be a bit more flexible about when they, they do those cons. So there's much more of a dialogue with those experts when something new comes in. And if you're going to be following the strictures of Mr. Justice Cotter, keeping in touch with your core experts, making sure they're up to date, whether anything that comes in which is um, new affects their opinion, so you can adjust your valuation. I think that should be reflected in cost budgets um, and that it should be expected that you should be allowed to have the time or indeed perhaps um, for more shorter conferences that reflects that in your costs. 
quite what um, particularly masters will make of that. I don't know whether they're going to stick to sort of linear view about conference, you know, report, conference, pre trial conference, and then attendance. I don't know, but it's worth if you're trying to argue for a more flexible budget to reflect that uh, more modern approach, it's worth having the app a, uh, a scarcliff in your back pocket to refer to. So, apart from reiterating, reiterating my thanks to those at Hex Falls and my insurers for what was a, a fascinating case, that takes me to um, four minutes to two. I think it's probably a good time to let you go and grab some lunch if you haven't already. Uh, and to thank you for your attendance. Um, I won't ask you all to unmute uh, and say anything, but I will uh, look forward to any uh, emails or anything else that this has generated. So thanks very much. I'm going to end the Zoom call there. Goodbye.